Good evening. Let's go ahead and uh, open up in a word of prayer. <clears throat> Lord, uh, we just want to come before you humbly, just thanking you, Lord, for this opportunity to hear your word. For some of us, maybe for the second or third time today, but we ask, Lord, that um, that you would be here, Lord, that you would uh, uh, reveal yourself through your word, Lord, that we would uh, uh, leave this place with uh, more of you, Lord. We ask, Lord, that as we open up our Bibles, that uh, you would open up our hearts, Lord, and do the work uh, that needs to be done. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, tonight we are going to finish the book of Esther. We are covering chapter 9 and chapter 10, so if you can start making your way there, if you're not there yet, we're going to cover chapter 9 and 10 of Esther. Uh, chapter 10 is like three verses. I, I would have I just made it into one chapter. I don't know why they uh, did that, but um, we're covering chapters 9 and 10, and we're looking at um, basically uh, a celebration of sorts, a celebration. If you were with us, the first uh, chapter of Esther, we started off with the celebration uh, the king, uh, Xerxes, or Ahasuerus, as the Bible refers to him here, was trying to rally up troops to, um, to go against the Greeks, to go against the Macedonians. So he had this eight-month-long uh, rallying uh, celebration, and at the end of the eight months, he had like a week-long open bar type of a, a debauchery uh, deal going on, where... Uh, People were getting drunk, decisions were, wrong decisions were uh, being made and so on. And we saw that, that in the midst of it all, the king uh, vanished Vashti, his wife. So we start off with a celebration, a bad celebration, by the way. And now we end up with another celebration. We end the book of Esther with a good celebration, a godly celebration, a celebration in regards to salvation. Celebration in regards to salvation. And that's going to be one of the, the bigger themes here in, in this chapter here. A celebration in regard to salvation. If you're taking notes, I'm giving you here the outline of tonight's message. It's basically three things. Salvation, first 18 verses. Celebration, the rest of the chapter. And then elevation, the three little verses in chapter 10. Salvation, celebration, and elevation. We're going to look at these three topics in these two chapters. I titled the message tonight, A Formidable Force. A Formidable Force. And, and something that is formidable... It is something or someone that strikes fear. For example, Goliath. He was a formidable opponent. I get, he struck fear in the, uh, in the Israelite army. David, of course, uh, as far as his appearance goes, he didn't have any facial hair, the Bible, the Bible tells us. He didn't uh, uh, look uh, strong or, or in comparison to Goliath. He was a pretty scrawny guy. So physically, he was not a formidable opponent. But uh, spiritually and behind the scenes, because God was with him, because he had a giant faith, he was a very formidable opponent. And he took down Goliath. And we see different guys in the Bible that are formidable guys. But today we're going to look at how the Israelites in Persia are a formidable force. And we as a church today can, can take some notes and can learn from them. And do some of the things that they, they did. And I'm not talking about carrying weapons and, and killing people. I'm not talking about that. Um, but what I am talking about is, is different uh, things that we can do as a church to, to uh, really uh, to fight that spiritual battle that we should always be uh, fighting. Because we also have a common enemy and we know that behind the scenes it is the same enemy that we are talking about here. The devil himself who wants to take out God's people. So let's start looking here at chapter 9 verse 1. If you can go there with me. And again, what we've been doing with the book of Esther is reading through the verses, covering some observations, not all of them, and then leaving our points and applications towards the end. It says here in, in uh, verse 1 of chapter 9, now in the 12th month, that is the month of Adar on the 13th day. Some think it's March 7th. We don't know for sure. It says, the time came for the king's command and his decree to be executed. What day was that? That was D-Day. That was the day that Haman had imposed upon the Persian land, the day when all the Jews would be killed. The day that it was legal to kill and wipe out women and children that were Jewish. Okay, Kind of like the Holocaust. We've seen this in the past. And this is what's happening here. The day finally came, but notice the opposite occurred. How is that? Because it says here, on the day that the enemies of the Jews had hoped to overpower them, 
but the opposite occurred in that the Jews themselves overpowered those who hated them. And here we see the, the, under, the underdog, the, the minority here, overpowering the majority. And there was many people, by the way, that hated the Jews throughout the Persian Empire. And today we see that as well. There's a spirit of anti-Semitism. Uh, many people hate the Jews. Just look at this and oh, turn on the, the news. The surrounding uh, 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 nations around uh, Israel today, they, 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 they hate them. They want to wipe them out, even the, the UN as well. Um, you know, just trying to take legitimacy from uh, a lot of the, the iconic places in, in Israel. Rightly, the Bible talks about the fact that Israel is a nation of, of the Jews. God gave them, the, the, the title deed is here in the Bible. God gave them that nation. It rightly belongs to them. And we see the Spirit here even so. But what does God do? God protects His people. Verse 2 says, The Jews gather together in their cities throughout all the provinces of King Ahasuerus to lay hands on those who sought their harm. Again, last week we talked about the fact that you have the right to bear arms, but you don't have the right to be silent. Here they picked up arms and they were ready to defend themselves. Notice this is not murder. This is self-defense. They're protecting their family, their children, uh, the, the, their property, and so on. So they're protecting their lives. So they bear arms here. And notice what it says here. And no one could withstand them because fear of them fell upon all people. And all the officials of the provinces, the satraps, the governors, and all those doing the king's work helped the Jews because the fear of Mordecai fell upon them. So again, Mordecai is now prime minister. He has the king that Haman had. The Lord has elevated uh, Mordecai. And, and, and Mordecai's co-workers and all those that were under him, they, they, there was a fear of Mordecai. They knew Mordecai was a Jew. They knew the queen was a Jew, Jewess as well. So there was this, this fear of Mordecai, this fear of maybe retaliation. Not many would try to go against uh, Mordecai knowing his power and position. And this is what we see here. Even the, the government workers, these Gentiles, were helping the Jews. And that, that uh, also is a, an interesting observation as well. They were four the Jews. Verse 4 says, For Mordecai was great in the king's palace, and his fame spread throughout all the provinces. For this man, Mordecai became increasingly uh, prominent. Mordecai was great in the king's palace. And I think that's kind of interesting. You know, Mordecai's uh, greatness started within the proximity of the king. I think our greatness should start within the proximity. I mean, you, we're not great because of anything of ourselves, right? God is the one that elevates us. But here's an interesting picture because his greatness starts there within the king's pal palace and then it spreads throughout. And that's how it should be. That's how it should be in our lives as well. We allow the Lord, we humble ourselves and we allow the Lord to exalt us. And he does that work on his own. And this is what we're seeing here. Verse 5 says, Thus the Jews defeated all, notice all their enemies with the stroke of the sword, with slaughter and destruction, and did what they pleased with those who hated them. And in Shushan, the citadel, the Jews killed and destroyed 500 men. And Shushan, again, it's a city right there where the king is at, the queen and all that. Just alone in that city, there was 500. And it says here in verse 7, Also Parshanatha, Dalphon, as, you know, I'm going to murder some of these names, but uh, Aspatha, Paratha, Adalia, Aridatha, Parmashtha, Ariza, Aridai, and Vajizatha, the ten sons of Haman, the sons of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews, they killed. But they, they did not lay hand on the plunder. So they kill these, uh, these uh, descendants of Haman. They kill his kids, basically. I mean, they, were, they probably weren't little kids. They were probably grown men already. And you could tell, it's implied here, that these men weren't just sitting home eating popcorn while this stuff was happening. No, these guys went against the Jews, and the Jews defended themselves, and that's how they got killed. They got killed in battle. So, they kill them. They were still around. They got killed as well. And it's kind of interesting that they don't take any plunder. They don't take any of this stuff. And if you remember, the first two chapters we talked about the, uh, where Haman came, came from. Haman was an Ag Ag Agagite. That means he was a, a descendant of Amalek, the Amalekites, uh, the the arch enemies of the Israelites and God told Saul, King Saul to kill, wipe out all the Amalekites what does Saul do? He wipes them out? No, he, he, he wipes out uh, most of them, a lot of them but he lets King Agag live and that was partial obedience and not only that God told him not to take anything and he took plunder and what happens later? Well, Saul is dethroned 
And it's just very interesting to me that now, generations later, now the Jews are being completely obedient in that they're taking out all the Amalekites in this, in this place and they are not taking any plunder, the opposite of King Saul. And it's kind of interesting to me that now there is complete obedience and because of that, I believe, now there was going to be a complete blessing, God's, complete, uh, God's protection here. It says here in verse 11, back to the text, On that day, the number of those who were killed in Shushan, the citadel, was brought to the king, and the king said to Queen Esther, The Jews have killed and destroyed 500 men in Shushan, the citadel, and the ten sons of Haman. So here's the king. He says, What have they done in the rest of the king's provinces? So he's curious about, well, there was 500 here, so close to uh, the queen and Mordecai. How, much, how many more people were outside of, these, of the city gates? It says here, now, what is your petition? It shall be granted to you. And what is your further request? It shall be done. And we can see here that the queen had not lost favor with the king. At the beginning of these chapters, we saw how Queen Esther was beautiful, no doubt. But her real beauty was an inward beauty. It was a skin-deep beauty because she was obedient. She was obedient to Mordecai. She was obedient to uh, uh, the guys that were over the harem. And, and, and she found favor. She was obedient to the king and she found favor with the king as well. And that was really her, her real beauty. That's what, that's what uh, the, the Lord used to uh, place her in such a position. And she still has favor. Then uh, Esther said, verse 13 here, If it pleases the king, let it be granted to the Jews who are in Shushan to do again tomorrow according to today's decree. So what is she doing here? She's asking for an extension. 24 hours for the Jews to defend themselves. 24 more hours to, to bear arms. I don't know, maybe she has some, some insight, some intel as far as, you know, an, a secret attack. Maybe the, uh, there were still enemies of the Jews waiting to attack after, you know, this March 7th, if, if it was March 7th, uh, was over. Maybe there was people who were going to attack. And we're about to see that there were at least 300 people that wanted to kill them. So this is a wise uh, petition here because she asked for an extension. And you know what? She gets her uh, extension here. It says here, and let Haman's ten sons be hanged on the gallows. Now she's asking for the corpses here, because these guys are dead, for their corpses to be hung uh, on these gallows. Verse 14 says, So the king commanded this to be done. The decree was issued in Shushan, and they hanged Haman's ten sons. Now there is a difference of opinion by different scholars and Bible students as far as if, if they were actually hung, or, they were, or more literally they were uh, pierced. Okay? They were impaled. And that was, it wasn't a pretty sight. The Assyrians did it, by the way. So we don't really know how this hanging was, but we do know that it was a display, a visible display, to uh, prevent people from rising up against the government, to prevent people from rising up against the, the Persians and Esther and Mordecai. It's kind of like crucifixion back in Jesus' day. Crucifixion, the, those that were crucified were displayed on the roadside. So people would think twice before breaking the law. They would think, well, that's going to be me if I break the law. And this is something similar where Esther, I would say it's a form of mercy in a sense because anybody that would rise up to go against the Jews, even after 500 that had already been killed of their enemies, this is what would happen to them basically. It was sort of like a warning shot here. So here we're saying all this stuff happened. Uh, they get another day, an extra day, <coughs> and... Uh, we see here that there actually indeed was more people that were out there, more of the enemies. Verse 14, so the king commanded this to be done. The decree was issued in Shushan, and they hanged him and ten sons. And the Jews who were in Shushan gathered together again on the 14th day of the month of Adar, two days now, and killed their 300 men at Shushan, but they did not lay a hand on the plunder. So now if, we're, if you're taking count, if, that, you know, if that's important to you, the, how many numbers, I mean the Bible chooses to give us uh, numbers here, there's about 810 people, casualties or fatalities, whatever, 810 people dead now. 810, the first 500 on the first day, and then the 10 sons of Haman, and now another 300. 810, just in Shushan here, just in, within the city um, gates. 810 here, but we still don't know how many were killed outside of, of the city uh, walls. They killed 300 there. It says in verse 16, The remainder of the Jews in the king's provinces gathered together and protected their lives, had rest from their enemies, and killed 70, notice that, 75,000 of their enemies. 75,000 people that came up against the Jews. But they did not lay a hand on the plunder. And it's interesting that the Bible will tell us this three times, like we forgot the first time, right? They did not lay a hand on the plunder. I think that's significant. 
Verse 17, this was uh, on the 13th day of the month of Adar, and on the 14th of the month, they rested and made it a day of feasting and gladness. So celebration, uh, salvation brought about celebration, as we can see here. But the Jews who were at Shushan assembled together on the 13th day as well as on the 14th. This is a recap of what's been going on, right? The, the Jews within Shushan, they fought two days and they rested on the third day. The, um, the Jews outside of the city walls, they fought one day and they rested the day after. Okay, This is just minor details, but I'm, I'm sure if God wanted to place them here, they are important for us to take, it, uh, take into account. And this is what we're seeing here. There is a holiday that is established because there was salvation, because God protected His people throughout all these uh, all these things. What, what what was supposed to be a day of gloom and doom became a day uh, of celebration. Now the remaining verses that we're going to read are about the the establishing of this day and some of the details in regards uh, to this day. We know verse eighteen tells us that it's a day of feasting and gladness. Okay, so it's sort of like Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, maybe that makes sense a little bit. There was gladness, there was feasting, there was gratefulness and all that. Verse 19 says, Therefore the Jews of the villages who dwelt in the unwalled town celebrated the 14th day of the month of Adar. Again, they were having the same things. And notice in verse 20, And Mordecai wrote these things and sent letters to all the Jews near and far, who were in all the provinces of the king Ahasuerus, to establish among them that they should celebrate yearly the 14th and 15th days of the month of Adar. So two days of victory, those days they were to celebrate as the days on which the Jews had rest from their enemies, as the month which was turned from sorrow to joy for them, and from mourning to a holiday, that they should make them days of feasting and joy, of sending, notice, pre it's like Christmas too, sending presents to one another and gifts to the poor. So even the poor are being blessed through this uh, uh, joyous uh, day, or better said, holiday. So the Jews accepted the custom which, had, uh, <clears throat> which they had begun, as Mordecai had written to them, because Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, the enemy of all the Jews, had plotted against the Jews to annihilate them. A lot of the same information. And then it gives us the, the name of this holiday, which is Purim. To this day, they are still celebrating Purim. The Jews still celebrate Purim. And it's a time where they gather together. I think the first days they, they fast and there is some sort of a, a, a mourning and ashes and all that. But then comes the day when they go to the, the synagogue and, and, and they, they pray and the book of Esther is read out loud, and when Haman's name pops up, the people yell something out. Their, their goal is to blot out his name, basically. And this is the thing that happens yearly, that, that, that the Jews, a lot of the Jews celebrate. They uh, pass out gifts, I mean, I think uh, uh, fruit inside of, uh, you know, different types of breads and all kinds of gifts. It's a day of, of gladness and feasting, and they still remember this to this day. They are doing that, they are being obedient to to what God, uh, you know, to what the Bible basically calls them um, to celebrate here. This is a mandatory holiday, by the way, and they called it uh, Purim. I remember one one uh, a while back, uh, a couple years back, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu from Israel met with Obama, the president here, and uh, and it was during that time when they were talking about an Iran deal and all that, and 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 Prime Minister uh, Netanyahu. This is a few days before uh, before Purim, and. Uh, and, and Netanyahu told them, you know, this is not the first time that the Persians try to wipe us out, try to kill us. Because it was the same Persians here. Today, modern day Iran is, is Persia, basically. And, and he tells them, it's not, the, it's not the first time that they try to kill us. And then uh, Netanyahu takes out this beautiful scroll of Esther and he gives it to, uh, to uh, Obama. And this is sort of what we're seeing here. It's very relative because, we, as I said before, there is still this sort of... Um, animosity against the Jews, this anti-Semitism. But God turned that stuff around to protect His people. They were celebrating this mandatory holiday. I want you to skip over here to, uh, to verse 27. The Jews established and imposed it upon themselves and their descendants and all who would join them that without fail they should set, notice that, without fail, they should celebrate these two days every year according to the written instructions and according to the prescribed time that these days should be remembered and kept throughout every generation, every family, every province, and every city, that these days of Purim should not fail to be observed. Wow, pretty, pretty, uh, pretty strict, right? Uh, among the Jews, and, and that the memory of them should not perish among their descent. Here's the key. All this stuff, the, the details of the holiday, was because of this last sentence that I read. 
that the memory of them should not perish from among their descendants. The goal here was for them not to forget. And we're going to look at that in a, in a few minutes. The goal of not forgetting what God did in the past. The goal of not forgetting what God did in the past. So they established a holiday to be remembered. So they established a holiday to be remembered. Verses 29 and on talk about the similar, uh, similar things here. Sort of like a summary of what's been going on. But it basically tells us that Mordecai pushes the decree, and this is established as a national holiday there in Persia. Anybody could celebrate it, but the Jews had to celebrate it as a reminder so that they would not forget what God uh, did. There was some fasting and lamenting as well, as uh, verse 31 tells us. Verse 32 says, So the decree of Esther confirmed these matters of Purim, and it was written in the book. What book? doesn't tell us, but it was one of the history books, maybe the Chronicles of Persia. Chapter 10 now says, and King Ahasuerus imposed tribute on the land and on the islands of the sea. I don't know. He, he, he's establishing a tax here. I don't know if they were going to use the money that was not taken to pay these taxes. But this is what the Bible tells us. Verse 2 says, And all the acts of his power and his might and the account of the greatness of Mordecai to which the king advanced him, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Media and Persia? For Mordecai the Jew was second. Notice that he was second to King Ahasuerus and was great among the Jews, and well received by the multitudes of his brethren, seeking the good of his people, and speaking peace to all his countrymen. So, the book of Esther ends with a pretty good note, a pretty good uh, praise for Mordecai here, right? The little guy, because that's what his name really literally means, Mordecai, little man, or little guy. And it ends here with him being a, a big guy, in a sense, before people, because God rightly uh, exalted him. Speaking peace to all his countrymen. Notice that, that Mordecai looked out for others, the needs of others. He put himself before others. Or excuse me, he put others before himself, better said. And because he put uh, others before himself, God placed him above others. And that is a constant theme that we see here in, in, in the scriptures. So, what have, we, what have we seen so far and what can we learn from these observations? And I think there's three things that I want to show you tonight. Again, I gave you the outline. We saw how there are three topics. There is salvation, there is celebration, and elevation. So we're going to start with salvation. We saw that there's a war. There's like a civil war in the nation. The Jews are fighting the Persians, and there is a mix of different people that are non-Jews as well. I'm assuming that you know, some of those people hated the Jews. Well, there's a fight, but the God gives the Jews the victory. We see that a lot of people are killed. 75,000 plus 810, you do the math. A lot of people are killed. But I think one of the observations that we can draw, for, draw from and learn from is that the Jews gathered together. I want you to go back to verse 2. That's our key verse here. The Jews gathered together and no one could withstand them. That's basically the, the, the message there in verse 2. They gathered together and no one could withstand them. Okay? And this, their respective cities, of course, they gathered in, in one place and then no one could withstand, you know, withstand them. And I think that's interesting. Because today, we as a church, are we not called to gather together? Are we not called to come together as a body? Uh, the Bible refers to us as the body of Christ. When Saul of Tarsus was persecuting the church, did Jesus not tell uh, Saul, 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 why are you persecuting me? He was referring to, to, to the church of Christ, the visible body of Christ here on earth. Because you and I, we're, we're the body of Christ. We, we should be a knit uh, together people. Some of you guys are hands. Some of you guys are, 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 are the feet. Some of you guys are, uh, are some of us are, are, are the eyes and the ears and the hands and so on. There's different gifts. We read chap read um, uh, 1 Corinthians chapters 12 to 14. Look at the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Look at how God has, has given us different gifts, how we are interdependent. Sometimes we think, well, the pastor is in charge of doing everything for the church and all that, but that's not the case. And it, it, rightly so, neither am I only in charge of teaching. I'm not a hireling and I'm not just involved with just teaching, right? There's one-on-one -on -one stuff that I do as well and administrative things that I have to do. But the point is that the church is interdependent. There's different gifts, different responsibilities, and it doesn't work. Church doesn't work if we don't come together. See, the Jews and us today, we have two, uh, two similarities. Number one, we have the same enemy. Yeah, there was people here involved trying to kill them, but really, behind them, behind the people, was the same enemy. Because, see, this was the devil's doing. Now, I'm not saying the devil made me do it. They are very much responsible for the things that they do, of course. But we know that there's a spiritual battle going behind the scenes. 
There's always a spiritual battle. The Bible tells us that the, the enemy, the devil, is like a roaring lion. He's prowling to see who can, he can devour. And the Bible tells us that the unbeliever, he has a veil. He has a veil before him, he or she. They have a veil before them, and they cannot see till they, they, they are reborn. They are born again, and then the veil is removed. I remember before I got saved, I, I had a Bible. I, 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 w I would get locked up in juvie, and they had a Bible available, and I would read it. And I thought, well, I'm going to get some brownie points with God, and I'm going to read some scriptures, and then he's going to let me out, and I'll try to be good, and so on. But I, I read it, but I never understood it till the day that I repented of my sins. And, and it was like this, this unveiling. My eyes were open, and I, I understood the scriptures, and I had a hunger for it now. And that's what I'm talking about here. Yeah, there's people involved, but really, there is a, a, the same enemy that is involved. So number one, similarity. We have the same enemy. We are fighting the same enemy. Number two, the Jews and the church are fighting to save people's lives. They were fighting to save their lives. We are fighting to save souls. See, the, our job, our main ministry is to preach the gospel. Our main ministry is to reach other people uh, for Jesus. So they don't have to go to hell. See, hell, hell, a, a eternal damnation, is, uh, is really the uh, going somewhere where God never meant somebody to go, really, if you think about it. Because the Bible tells us that hell is, is um, uh, created, was created for Satan and his demons. Think about that for a minute. God created a, a, a place for Satan and his demons to go, but people end up going there when they were never meant to go there. And, and it really leaves the ball in our court. But he calls the church. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, how are they going to hear unless somebody tells them, right? How is somebody go unless somebody is sent? How beautiful are the feet of those who uh, uh, preach the gospel. Here's our first point. Without community, there is no unity. Strength is not in capability, but in reliability. Maybe you heard this before. Somebody put it like this. It's not your ability, but your availability. It's not your ability, the things you can do, how well equipped you are, but the fact that you're there, your availability. See, a lot of these people, a lot of these Jews that were fighting, they were old. There were kids there. Little girls, obviously, probably, I'm sure, I'm sure that they were, they were there as well. But they were there. The, the point is that they were there, and, and God did the rest. When there is unity, there is community. And that is, there's, something, there, there's something about that. When we gather together, it's like sheep, right? The Bible likens believers to sheep. And a lot of the times it's because we are dumb like sheep in a sense. We, 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 when we scatter, when the sheep scatters, when the sheep goes away from the flock, it, the sheep becomes vulnerable. It becomes vulnerable and, and, and the enemy comes and it devours it and so on. The wolf comes. But the sheep's job is to do the two simple things. Stay behind the shepherd and stay with the flock. The flock that, uh, that gathers will not scatter. The flock that gathers will not scatter. So what do these people do? They gather together and they fought together. And because of that, they overpower their enemy. And guys, this is what I believe. I believe that when we do the simple things like gathering together, whether you're equipped or not, whether you, you feel like, well, uh, you know, I'm not able, I'm not a good speaker, or I don't have the, the character or the, you know, smile on my face all the time, you know, that's beside the point. The point is, can, can you do the simple things? Just gather, just come alongside somebody and, and, and um, come alongside the church body and, and be there. And you know what? God blesses that. God will bless your availability, your reliability. And here's the thing. God was going to have uh, their front. God had their front, but they first needed to have each other's back. Okay? God is going to have the front of the church when the church starts having its, each other's back. When somebody can be there to carry each other's burdens. <clears throat> and this is what I see here. You know, people showed up. People showed up to fight. People showed up to protect themselves. We as a church, <clears throat> we show up to, to pray. To, to listen to the word of God. To apply it. To reach people and to teach people, right? But we got to assemble together. <clears throat> and you know what? This principle of unity is also applicable in um, the business world or even in the home, and any other area of life, I would say, that involves people and community. <clears throat> Let's think of a job. You know, wherever uh, this Rob works uh, for KYMA, <clears throat> he's uh, the, the, the weather guy, right? You're still doing weather, sports. 
Um, but think of Rob, right? Think of, you know, that there's someone that's a manager that's in charge and there are other people doing different things. But imagine if there was disorder, if people just didn't want to show up to work. That would give Rob some extra work as well in some areas. And, and, and it would be a more of a burden on his shoulders. So, and in anywhere, when there is no unity, when there is no community, then things fall apart. And the Bible tells us that. You know, a house divided against itself, it shall not stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. That house cannot stand. The house here is metaphorical of any, anything in our lives. The church, for example, right? Our home, our physical home, right? The Bible calls men to be the priests of the home, to water their wives with the, with the word of God and so on. Even the Bible tells us about the, the husband being the head and the wife submitting to her husband as unto Christ, of course. We are not to be dictators over our wives. We are to love them as Christ Love the church. But if there is disorder even in our homes, it's going to spill over with our children and it's not going to work. There's got to be unity. Maybe you heard this before a hundred times, right? Uh, what is it? The uh, uh, family that, that prays together stays together. A church, really it applies to the church. A church that prays together stays together. A church that fights together stays uh, together. So let's be involved. Let's get together. Let's not just be spectators watching, but let's be participators, right? Getting together to fight together because there's always a spiritual battle going on. I want you to notice something else before we move on to the next point. The Jews got together. There was a battle there and they brought swords. They brought swords, right? Whether they could use them or not, the Bible doesn't tell us. But they had swords, right? There was killing. There was slaughtering. God gave them the battle, but they needed to bring the swords. God has given us a battle already, but we need to pull the sword out of the sheath, if I may, right? We, we need to, to be available to do these things, right? To, to, to press on, to go forward here. And it's, it, it's the same thing with anybody in the scriptures. For example, Noah, the Bible says that before he walked into the ark, he walked with God. You see that? And it's not so much that Noah was a, 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 a great, uh, uh, you know, a swimmer or a, a you know that or he or because he could steer a boat because really this was like a, this was like a floating coffin okay the ark was like a floating coffin if you see the schematics and all that the blueprint of that that the bible gives us it's like a floating coffin all he had to do was go in the ark walk there was a, a walking that was involved here with his family notice that there was even community the community of eight and the unity of eight noah and his and his, his three sons and their wives and his wife and so on there was even in in in, in the first uh, uh the Bible talks about Noah being the man that found God's favor there. There was community and there was unity and God blessed it and they were able to repopulate the earth. Same thing with David. David told Goliath. This is what David told Goliath here. He says, this day the Lord will deliver you into my hand. This guy was pretty sure of himself. Was he just, was he cocky? Was he, what was wrong with him? Well, he trusted in God. That's the thing. He says, this day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. David tells us something very important here. We've already won the battle. We've, the enemy, he's already lost. He knows how the story ends, right? He's, only, he's trying to scavenge as much as he can. He's trying to keep people blind. He's trying to keep you uh, uh, not available. He wants you to stay out of the scene and not fight, right? The enemy doesn't get involved with somebody that's not involved, right? He, he's not going to bother with us if, if we're not doing anything for the kingdom of God. But David knew this. He knew the battle was won, but he still had to step into the battlefield, right? He still had to take his slingshot and, his, and the stones. He still had to step in there, but God was going to take care of the giant. So again, it's not about ability, but availability. Not about ability, but availability. Not about capability, but reliability. Just being there. You know, and, and when you just show up when you're there... Where the church is at, God blesses it. I shared a first and second service story yesterday at the uh, at the outreach in Algodones. I was uh, it was during sort of some downtime when uh, right before worship started, and I was just standing there by the bleachers or this uh, cement area, and there was this man that approached me and he asked me if I was a brother in Spanish, and I said, "Yeah, I'm a Christian." That's what he was referring to, and I said, "Yeah, I'm a Christian." And I asked him, "Are you a Christian?" And he said, well, um, my family are all Christians and all that. And I asked him, hey, do you know the gospel? And he couldn't really answer the question properly. He tried to quote a verse. Um, and then I told him, look, here's the gospel. I just, you know, I like to get straight to the point uh, before the conversation just goes awry and just goes somewhere else. 
And I told him, look, here's the gospel. Jesus died for your sins. If you acknowledge that you're a sinner and you repent of your sins and you trust in Christ alone for your salvation, that he died for you and he rose again on the third day, you will be saved. And I asked him, do you want to accept Jesus right now? And he said yes, and he accepted the Lord, and we prayed. And, and you know what? Really, he came up to me because he had a need. He wanted a bus pass to get to a, a certain place in Mexico. He wanted a bus pass. But instead, he got a, a free ride to heaven, basically, because the, the salvation is by grace through faith, not by works, right? But he, he, that was an opportunity, and I wasn't looking for him. Rob and I, we went looking for people to preach the gospel, too, but sometimes, you know, people are just busy and doing their own thing. But this guy came. This guy approached me. And it's like that, too, where it's just being there. If I wasn't there, I wouldn't have seen that happen. It's about availability, not so much ability. In reality, we all have the ability to share our faith. We know if we didn't, then we, how, how can we say we know Jesus Christ if we don't know the gospel? If we know the gospel, we should be able to share the simple gospel. Look at, at, at Pentecost, Acts chapter 2. We see that Jesus tells the disciples to wait for the Holy Spirit, right? What do the disciples do? What are they doing when the Holy Spirit comes down in Pentecost? They are gathered together. The Holy Spirit showed up in one place. The Holy Spirit showed up where the church was already praying together. And then what happens? Then three people get saved. And you see this constant theme in the Bible. When the people are together, that's when the stuff happens. Remember Thomas? Doubting Thomas? You know when Jesus resurrected, he resurrected on Sunday. And that Sunday is when he met with the other disciples where they were at. He didn't even have to knock. Now he could go through doors. He, he went through a door. He just popped in there. And it was on Sunday. But who was missing the first church uh, ser service? Thomas. Jesus did not go look. For, Jesus could have gone to Thomas, by the way. He could have go. He could have, wherever Thomas was at, Jesus knew. But Jesus chose not to go to Thomas. So Jesus came the next Sunday. Now Thomas had heard, but he didn't believe it, as you know the story. But he showed up to service the second Sunday. And that's when Jesus popped up on Sunday. And now Thomas is like, my Lord and my God, my, theon, and my theos and my curios in Greek, right? And he bows down and he believes Jesus Christ. But why is that? Why didn't Jesus just appear to him where he was at? Why did Jesus wait till, till Thomas came to you into community? I think there's something to learn from that. Because the stuff happens in community. God wants us together so he can do the stuff. Look at uh, the next observations here. The salvation brought celebration. That's our second uh, um, part of the outline here. Celebration. There was a fight. There was a victory. And then there was celebration. There was a mandatory holiday. You know the word holiday literally means holy day. Thanksgiving is a holy day for us because we, we, we set it apart every year to be grateful, to eat turkey, you know, and to spend time with the family and all that. You know, some people have different traditions in regards to it, but really that's the core of Thanksgiving. Uh, you know, we have a mandatory uh, um, time as well as believers to have gladness and have joy. You know, we are called not to be thankful just on Thanksgiving, but we are called to be thankful every, every day of the week. Thanksgiving is just a reminder that we should be thankful. Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. In everything give thanks, Paul tells us. The psalmist says in Psalm 107, Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. He is gracious. Love exists. His love exists uh, forever. Let those who have been redeemed by the Lord declare it. Those whom He redeemed from the power of the enemy. This is, the kind of, this is why I chose this verse, because of this last section here. Those, who have re, he had, those whom He redeemed from the power of the enemy. That's what we see here with these guys, right? They were just redeemed. And how were they thanking God? Well, through a holiday. We have been redeemed. The Lord has saved us. How do we thank God? Well, when we come to church, when we sing these songs, we're not just singing them to sing them. We're, it's a celebration. Church is a celebration, by the way. That's why I said, you know, with the Christian, every day is a holiday. We, we are to worship God every day. The stuff we do, we are only doing the stuff because of, as a response to what Jesus has already done for us. Here's our second point. In order to keep things fresh, we must remember, reflect, and rejoice. In order to keep things fresh in our life, we must remember, reflect, and rejoice. Remember what Jesus did for you. Don't forget that. Reflect on it and rejoice on it. When salvation is begotten, it mustn't be forgotten. Do you see the, the uh, connection I'm trying to make here for you guys? There was salvation for them, physical salvation, that, that brought about celebration. For us, we have a spiritual salvation. 
and it should bring about a celebration. I'm not talking about walking around with a smile on your face all the time, but what I am talking about is worshiping with intent, right? We worship with intent. We, we might be singing uh, repetitive songs, and we might be reading some repetitive stuff in the scriptures, but it is always a celebration. And God put some, God added some interesting verses here, some pretty direct verses to remind us to keep, uh, uh, you know, this gladness and this rejoicing. Because see, the Bible, in reality, is a book of uh, repeated themes. The Bible is a book of remembrance. And you might say, well, I've read the Bible back and forth two, three times in several different translations, but you know what? You're still, uh, you still got to read it. You still got to continue to read the stuff because a lot of times we don't, we don't keep everything we read. A lot of stuff we forget and it is reminders. This is what Jesus said when he's talking about communion. He says, do this in remembrance of me, 1 Corinthians 14. He says, do this in remembrance of me. You have the, 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 the cracker, we're going to do communion next Sunday, by the way. You have the, the, the cracker there, which is symbolic of his body, and you have uh, the, uh, the, the wine or the grape juice, which is symbolic of his blood. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. And get, guess what? What was he alluding to? He was alluding to what he did for us on the cross. Because this stuff, communion, is a reminder. He's reminding us that he died for us. Notice that. It's the same thing Jesus is doing. Communion is a celebration. Worship is a celebration, and we are to do it. But what happens? Here's the thing. Here's another interesting point, I think. They were supposed to instill this stuff into their kids. It was mandatory for the generations that came before them to exercise this stuff. Why is it important for our kids to know what Jesus Christ has done for us? Because see, if our kids don't know what Jesus did for us in, in our life, if we missed out on Jesus in the past, we're, we're going to miss out on Jesus in the present. If we don't acknowledge what he's done for us in the past, how are we supposed to acknowledge what he's doing for us now? And there's an interesting thing to this. To this, Think about it like this. Today, there's a lot of millennials. There's believers, of course, that are different ages. But there's a lot of millennials and younger folks that don't appreciate what the veterans have done for us in this country. The, the people that die, that shed their blood in the battlefield to protect us, to, to give us the freedom that we have today. And when, when, uh, when they forget that stuff, when they don't acknowledge that, they live very entitled. There's an entitlement attitude. They think that, well, I deserve free this and I deserve free that. And, 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 and they forget that. So in a more serious sense, when we forget the grace that God has given us, the things that Jesus Christ has done for us, we start to become entitled as well. Well, I deserve this. And I need this position. And I need to be given it now. And that's not the case with the Christian. There needs to be a humility because Christians, we should be the most thankful people of all because we have been given the greatest gift of all, right? What happens when we are not thankful? The Bible tells, thankfully the Bible tells us this. Romans chapter 1, Paul says, Because although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. There are many people like that today that suppress the truth. They know God or they, they know about God, but they refuse to be thankful. And we see this domino effect, this slippery slope of a, of a simple thing that we can do and just be thankful for God, celebrate salvation. When we don't do that, I think as a believer, you know, I, I think that, you know, we might, we might have a, 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 a saved um, soul, but we can have a lost life. We can have a saved soul, but we can live a lost life when we are not thankful. We become bitter and cold and entitled, and it shouldn't be that way. Let, let's, let's celebrate salvation. Let salvation be a time of celebration, right? Because, see, you don't have, church doesn't have to be boring, okay? It, it, you make it boring. You can make church boring. I, I know there's pastors that will put you to sleep and guys that are put you to sleep. Uh, pray for them. You know, pray for me as well. Maybe I do that to you guys, but you know what? Um, Bible study, you don't have to go to Bible study, you don't have to go to church, you don't have to pray, you don't have to do all this stuff that we do, you get to do this stuff. We get to, it's a privilege to do this stuff and it's a celebration, it's, it's worship practice. Because you know what, we're going to be doing this stuff in heaven with Jesus, we're going to be doing all this stuff all the time and some of us think, well, wow, I'm going to get bored repeating this stuff, right? But let me tell you this, it's not going to be boring, it's going to be great, it's going to be fresh and rejoicing and new all the time. Maybe just because just you can't imagine it right now doesn't mean it's not going to happen. God's Word tells us. God never lies. He is faithful. You know, we can look back at our life and we can see a mess. I know I see a mess in my life when I look back. And I'm pretty sure you do as well. You look back and you see the mess that you've left behind. But in that mess, you see a, a Messiah. And the Messiah has cleaned up our life and He's given us a new heart, right? A heart of flesh. 
So God can turn your mess into a message, and that's what we rejoice in. So again, guys, before we move on, to keep things fresh, let's remember, let's reflect, and let's rejoice. Because salvation uh, uh, that has been begotten should not be forgotten. It mustn't be forgotten. I'll finish with the, the, these few observations here in chapter 10 and even in chapter 9. Mordecai, you know what? Mordecai was a humble guy. He became king for a day. He was clothed like a king, but he went back to his post. Every time we see Mordecai, he's looking out for somebody else. Esther was an orphan. Her parents died, by the way. And who's the one that takes her in? Mordecai takes her in. And he becomes her adoptive father. Mordecai didn't have to take care of this girl. Somebody else could, could have taken her, but, but he chose to do that. Mordecai didn't have to save the king's life when he was little, when he was basically a, a, one of the small-time government workers, but he chose to save the king's life. And I want you to look at that. He was faithful in saving the king's life when he was low rank, and he was exalted to a higher rank, and then he was able to save all the Jews' life, right? He was involved in that process. This is what I'm saying. Mordecai is a great picture of somebody that is faithful in the little things, that has, that has continued to be faithful in the greater things. His name, by no coincidence, is Little Man. You see, big things come in small sizes or come in small packages. Big things come in small packages. Influence is determined by how big your heart is, not your ego. Remember Haman? He had a big ego. He had a small heart. But Mordecai was the opposite. And I think this is the key to, to remaining uh, um, uh, humble and usable by God. Because God is looking to see who He can use. But if you're, you're proud and you continue to be... Uh, cold and bitter and not willing to get out of your comfort zone, God will not use you. God will not use you till you humble yourself and allow God to do the work. See, greatness is found in littleness. Greatness is found in littleness. And, and I see Mordecai do display this so properly. Jesus told us this, so that the last will be first and the first last. You want to be first? Let God exalt you. Let God make you first. But first put others before yourself. Mordecai, put others before himself, Mordecai placed himself, you know, placed others before himself, and God placed him above others. And that's, that's the, the, the big theme that I see here. Notice that three times the Bible tells us that they did not take any plunder. I think Mordecai was behind this thing. Maybe he told them, hey, don't take anything. Just save your lives. Don't take any of the stuff. Just leave it behind. Isn't that what God called Saul to do? Isn't that what the, why the, the Israelites were failing battles because they took stuff. Remember Achan? They fought the, the, the giants in Jericho and they were victorious. But what does Achan, this dude, what does he do? He takes stuff and he hides it from the rest of the camp. And everybody's wondering, why didn't we beat the, the, the little town of Ai or I, right? And then the Bible, the, the, it is revealed to Joshua that there was sin in the camp. There was a taking of stuff when they shouldn't have taken anything. And I think the thing that will deter us from seeing victory, from being humble, is when we make church and even uh, ministry about what we can get from it, what we can take. Even this life, when we make it about having the, the big house or the, 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 the uh, several digits of, of, of money and all that, you know, when we make it about that itself, then, then we're going to miss out. We're going to miss the point of why God has us here uh, today. Jesus tells us where your treasure is, there your heart also will be so good question for us is you know where where is our treasure where does our treasure lie where where are we at in regards to our, our the true desires that God has for us are we people that long after the heart of Jesus that's a good that's a good way I think to end this message if you're taking notes please write down this recipe for success number one get behind God that's what we saw at the beginning the people got behind what God was already doing number two assemble together that's sort of the how how do we do it well, the Bible tells us to not forsake the gathering of the brethren. Assemble together. Fight together. Celebrate victory. When, when God gives you that victory, when God does that, when people get saved, you know what? Celebrate that. You know what happens? I think it's in Luke 15 or 16. It talks right after the particle son there or during that, you know. It talks about how when one sinner repents, there is a celebration in heaven. There is a great party in heaven. So shouldn't we celebrate as well? Num last one, number five, before we finish up in prayer here, remain humble. Get behind God, assemble together, fight together, celebrate victory, and always, always remain humble. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your word, Lord. We pray that we can take 
uh, uh, that we can remember this stuff, Lord. I know a lot of times, Lord, our, our brains and the busyness of life just uh, cause us to forget, Lord. I pray, Lord, that uh, we would remember, that we would be intentional about our no's and the stuff we heard tonight, that we would uh, exercise these things, Lord, practice these things, that you, that you may get the glory, Lord, and, and the honor. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together.